Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the session on talent this morning. This is part of the Future on Human Capital series. Uh, there's been an overview session which took place yesterday. Uh, there's the talent session this morning. Uh, then we're going to have the education session and the youth sessions coming up. Um, with the talent session, obviously, we're looking at uh, uh, not just individuals uh, and how they can deal with uh, uh, developing their own individual capital, but also uh, lifelong learning, the uh, retooling of education, uh, the refocusing of education, uh, and how to make labor markets more effective. Uh, it's really about uh, recruiting, retooling, and retaining talent. And for that, we have a fantastic panel here today uh, representing many different sectors and approaches to these questions. Uh, we have Mark Dure, who is from uh, DECO, which is a staffing and human resources uh, services company uh, based out of Japan, but covering all of Asia. Uh, we have uh, NV Tigerajan, or right. Tiger, uh, who runs, uh, is the president and CEO of Genpact, uh, a rather large business process outsourcing company uh, based out of India, but with people around the world, which raises a lot of questions, interesting questions about the breaking up labor or the way we look at work in and of itself. Uh, we have uh, Ronald Bruder, who is following a career as an entrepreneur building shopping malls. Uh, largely in North America, uh, is now running Education for Employment, uh, which is a, a not-for-profit looking at helping retool labor forces in the Middle East, North Africa. Uh, and Kevin Taylor, the president of Asia Pacific for British Telecom. Uh, British Telecom uh, has about 30,000 employees uh, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, which makes for uh, uh, quite a, a great deal of dealing with this issue of talent and trying to understand how to manage that across a very large organization. Uh, first, I, what I'd like to do is a little bit identify the, the scale and extent of the problem before we try to solve it. Uh, so maybe, uh, uh, Mark, ha looking at it from the market perspective, uh, how big an issue is talent? Uh, what are the challenges that, that people are facing? looking not just here in Asia, maybe first here a little bit in Asia where it's a particularly acute problem, speaking as somebody running uh, a business unit, the biggest challenge we face in our business, in fact, is hiring people and finding the right talent. Is that a common issue in this part of the world? Uh, and how would you characterize this issue globally given the number of clients that you're looking at and helping them find talent? Yeah, there's, uh, there's still a mismatch between um, where talent is and where it's needed. Uh, and there's also, uh, in, in my view, uh, quite an issue of the kinds of talent that is coming out of universities. We have uh, very good students that come out of universities who have uh, a great academic career, uh, but there seem to be a uh, disconnect between uh, what's needed in cor corporations and, and the, the skills that they bring to the table. Um, to address that, there needs to be, in my opinion, more uh, close cooperation between the academics and the corporations. What, what is the scale of the problem? People just aren't, they, they, I mean, there's a lot of people looking for jobs right now. Yeah. Uh, you're in the market of trying to. Well, for ease example, that. We, we, uh, uh, we could probably grow 50% a year in our engineering business in Japan if we had the talent. We can't, uh, we can't train them fast enough. We have to bring them in from universities uh, who, uh, where they're trained as engineers, if you will. On the, on the rote knowledge, uh, but then we have to teach them what that really means in the real world. Uh, and so if we could, if we could attract enough people uh, who, who had that kind of you know, basic ba background, uh, and if we had enough training space, um, or if we could hire them directly out of universities with already prepared to go to, into the workforce, then we could grow much faster. Kevin, BT, 30,000 people. You must have a fair amount of turnover there. Uh, is finding the right people a, a, a big challenge? Yeah, we have 3,000 directly and 30,000 with our JVs, by the way. But um, no, not really. I mean, I think. Uh, so talent is not a problem? Ta talent is not a problem. Uh, I think. Well, we solved it. We don't have to have a session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's taken a lot of time to uh, ensure your brand can attract talent. Sorry, your, your, brand, your brand needs to attract talent. Right. Um, 
And um, so for me, uh, um, you know, over the years, our, our BT has become a, uh, a company where talent wants to join. Um, having said that, from a wider spectrum, um, understanding the challenges that uh, uh, are there, um, uh, you know, from a sustainability point of view, we need more talent coming on board. Uh, I also think the, 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 the market for talent is, is changing. Uh, I think by 2020, you're almost going to get five generations of workers working together for the first time, um, which I think is a, a profound change. So you're going to get people who are just not retiring and kids coming in. And so you're going to get this, this whole blockage. And I think the change is going to, for me, um, when I see the new graduates coming in, they're so multi-talented. You know, they're using... Uh, uh, the new social dimension, you know, the internet, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, um, that I think for the first time the seniority piece is going to disappear and we're going to raise talent very quickly to get to the top. So people are going to get judged completely on capability. It's going to be interesting to see if it's like a football team, you know, your best play is up to 35 mm -hmm. and not when you're 50 or 60. Uh, Tiger, looking at from your perspective, you have, uh, you're effectively in the job of uh, uh, dividing off work and, and, and finding ways for companies to pass the work for you to find yep. employees. Well, what, what is the, 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 the talent issue that you face in your business and how you see the market? So, so we are actually in the business of uh, talent development and arbitrage. That's, that's the way we actually define our business. So. You know, just to dimension the problem for us, which kind of dimensions it for the world, 60,000 people, uh, mostly emerging markets, so therefore 20% attrition. So that's 12,000 just to backfill and 20% growth. So for a living, we hire 25,000 people a year. Uh, the problem is that when we hire them, they're not ready to deliver the services that they are expected to deliver, which often is basic finance, basic accounting, financial services work, stuff that you would expect people coming out of colleges to your point, to be ready to do with very quick training. Uh, we spend as much training them as we would training someone who's not a college graduate. We hire only college graduates. So it makes, it makes very little difference in that sense from your perspective whether this person has gone to university or not. Absolutely. Which comes back to Mark's point about the, the uh, universities not preparing people. So, so, so in effect, and this is not a reflection about us, I think it's a reflection of a large number of people in the industry. Uh, mm -hmm. We have our own university. We have our own curriculum, we train our own people, and we keep training them. Now, some of that is actually probably the way the world is going to be because, you know, to, to Kevin's point, uh, if you have someone who's worked for five years and is a great performer and has learned a lot five years back, it may be irrelevant today. Right. So how do you teach people new stuff that they have no chance to learn unless you actually have a program that teaches them regularly? Okay, which sort of segues very nicely into uh, Ronald's domain, which is, is retraining and, and retooling. What, what is your experience in terms of the success rate or what, what, is, what are the best approaches that seem to work in what you're trying to do? We operate in the MENA region, Middle Sorry, East. We operate in the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa. And so we have found that the youth there that enter the labor market are not prepared. They don't have the right skill set to do the work that's needed in the region. For instance, Tiger and I were talking about his needs in Morocco. And it's my hope that when we leave here, we will solve a lot of those problems for him because that's what we're good at. That's what we're very good at. We, we've learned that, uh, for instance, in Jordan, another country that we do a lot of work in, unemployment for college grads is twice what it is if you're not a college grad. So there's obviously a disconnect. And that in many of the countries that we operate in, the situation is that the employers cannot find the labor that they need. We're told that by the year 2035, 100 million new youth need to enter the labor force, not be unemployed in the region, in order to have the same status quo, which is not all that great now. We have 50% unemployment in many of these countries of youth. Not a sustainable model for democracy, which is why we do what we do. And what has proved most effective? What is the most effective technique for retooling? retooling? Well, quite frankly, the way we, the most effective technique is we work with employers, we work backwards. Our, we have local boards, local foundations, where we work on a franchise model, and it's the local foundation that decides what the needs are. And our board members are serious employers, and one of the reasons they're on the board 
in addition to helping their country, they want to find themselves the proper labor that they need to be able to grow. So, for instance, in Palestine, uh, there are thousands of engineering graduates coming off the labor market, into the labor market every year, very few jobs. We built a course in concert with a company called CCC, Consolidated Contractors. They're the largest employer in the Middle East. We take some of these youth and we built a course in Colorado State University and we train them to manage construction sites, for which there is a need. And so we do that across the board. In Jordan, if you failed your high school exit exam, you're basically unemployable. Well, we teach these kids work skills, which has been a very powerful program. So tying it very closely to the workplace and what the workplace is doing. Exactly. This is, a, by the way, a, an interactive session, and we'd like to welcome the people joining on the World Economic Forum website. Uh, also, would love to take questions and comments via Twitter, Sina Weibo. Uh, the hashtag is WEF Talent, W-E-F Talent, uh, or on Sina Weibo, WEF Talent hashtag again. Uh, and you can also uh, send in an email to talent at wef.ch uh, or here in the room, raise your hand uh, either way. Um, so, Mark, you, you're, you're quite passionate about this, this retooling and uh, tying the education more to the marketplace as well. Uh, universities, are they enough, closely enough working with the or associated with the workforce? to bring out graduates who don't need maybe Tiger's you know, same level of training um, and what can be done to address that. I mean, the approach that, that, that Ronald's talking about is very much uh, uh, tying it, you know, working backwards from employer to university. Is there a way to address their universities directly? Well, I, th I think there's two approaches. First of all, there are some universities who are, who are probably doing a really good job of this uh, who uh, employ a lot of um, um, professors or, or instructors from the corporate world. Uh, but there are many who are, are, they're completely staffed by academics. I think what we need to do is have more uh, corporate cooperation with the academics. In other words, people like myself, and I don't know whether any, any of you do this, but uh, I also teach a course at a university that's focused on careers in HR and, and things of that nature. This helps the, the, the young people who might be interested in HR career uh, to be better prepared for that and to understand what it is, what, what exactly is an HR career. That's, uh, that's point number one. The other side of the equation is how can we get academics to spend some time in the real world, in the working world, so that they know what they're talking about when they go back and teach the young people. So I think it's, it's, it's really got to be a two-pronged approach. But you, from your perspective, the universities are just too separated from the real world. Yeah, I think so. I mean, at a certain level, we want the university to be separated from the real world. They're supposed to teach people ideas and things they wouldn't have other times to explore, perhaps. But that's true. That's gone. It's it's too divergent. Yeah, it's it's too far the other the other side of the pendulum. Are there any examples where you think that it's been addressed in, a, in an appropriate way or well enough? I can't think of any off the top of my head. No. So <laughs> a big challenge. <laughs> um, which means uh, uh, you know we're going to have to accept that training level, uh, I mean, Tiger, have you, have you tried to work back to universities? So, so you know, or? for us, it's all about scale. So how do you get s universities to actually change their content so that the scale that they anyhow produce then solves, you know, needs of people like us? So the only way we found is to actually start partnering with the universities. And uh, to Mark's point, some of them are very open to that partnership, some of them are not, where you actually create content. You inject that content into their regular curriculum. And therefore, the graduates who come out, the undergrads who come out, actually have got trained in the curriculum that you want them to get trained in. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they're better, better, better ready to, to work. There are two challenges. One, uh, you know, it still needs, in many, many countries, partnership between public and private. Uh, because most of these universities are not necessarily private. So it's a public-private partnership. And you know, governments are still, our, our belief is governments are still far behind. Um, they're, not, they're not there. And second is uh, some of this addresses hard skills. You can teach accounting, you can teach technology, you can teach a lot of things. How do you teach the way you work in an organization, the way you run teams? Mm -hmm. Those are more difficult. And I think universities take a long time to understand that that's equally important to be successful uh, and to deliver value when you start working. Um, that's often the biggest challenge that we face when we hire people. Right, okay. Ronald. First program we ever launched in 06 was teaching soft skills. And quite frankly, at the time, I didn't know what they were. 
but I was at a meeting in Jordan with Khaled Toukan, the education minister who was revered MIT graduate, brilliant man. He sat me down and he said, you need to teach soft skills. So the good news, I have a really smart staff. I went back and I said, tell me what soft skills are and get me some. And we find it is phenomenal. We have a three-month program that we built with McGraw-Hill. And in that period of time, we teach these kids how to write a resume, interviewing, critical thinking, leadership, team building, what to wear, how to dress, what to say, public speaking. And they come out different people. They think out of the box. They're creative. They're uh, empowered. They're self-confident. They become self-fulfilling prophecies. And we shoot for 85% of our graduates getting employed when they leave us. And a key tool to making that happen is exactly what Tiger said, them having the soft skills. And sometimes we link it, we do it by itself. Other times we link it to a, to a skill. So for instance, in Jordan, if you failed your high school exit exam, we teach you how to install and repair air conditioners. But more important than that, or with that as a necessary ingredient, we teach them soft skills so they show to work up on time, they know how to play well with others, they know how to be productive. And some of these kids that we're now teaching the repair and installation, they're going to be the entrepreneurs of the future. We've had tremendous okay. success. Kevin, looking in from the inside rather than looking outside, are there a role for the, the company itself to play, internal training? Uh, uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's two-way, really. I mean, um, of course, there's internal training, there's performance management through, through careers, but there's also, um, I think, huge, huge learning that we get from uh, the young talent coming into our business. Um, yeah, the way they operate, the way they process, the way they think uh, is, you know, so much faster. So, uh, you know, I think we're talking about talent in the 21st century. I think we're not talking about a shortage of talent, uh, in my view. I mean, uh, if you look at the, um, the job data around the world, kids can't get jobs today. There's a lot of talent trying to get into business. So, um, uh, and there are certain pockets where there are challenges like India, but generally uh, I see a huge amount of talent coming in. You know, the wave is coming in. Uh, we've got to enhance the talent. I think you're going to see differences that typically people that came in uh, got specialized in one area. And now I think the younger talent is smart enough to get specialized in a couple of areas. That protects their future. That gives them insurance as well. But I think it's a two-way two -way deal. I think uh, it's also companies learning from the younger talent coming in and the uh, different ways of operation, different ways of thinking. And, uh, you know, we, we, we uh, actually interview kids across the world from the age of seven and eight uh, of uh, kids who are, you know, are my kids, for example, and we... We put them together, whether it be in Hong Kong, New York, London, and we put them together over telepresence. And we actually start to understand, you know, the way they're developing, the way they're thinking, the way they're, you know, uh, parallel processing. It's an amazing thing. And are, are, you, are you finding differences or sharp, sharp changes? Yeah, I mean, you know, they just, you know, they, I mean, just anyone with kids here will tell you they're doing three things at once. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're talking, they're videoing, and they're also answering mum in the left-hand corner. You know, I mean, they're, they're multi-processing. And, uh, uh, you know, I think we need to bring this new dimension of talent using technology uh, into the business to improve the efficiencies of, of organizations. And, you know, today, uh, if you look at the U.S., you know, companies aren't, they're the most efficient they've ever been. Look at the, look at the, look at the P&Ls, look at the balance sheets, look at the cash on you know, in market. And I just think as we enhance more and more of this talent, I think it's going to be uh, a huge upside for us going forward. But it's a different game. You know, also work-life balance. I mean, kids don't want to work seven days a week. They don't want to work at nine o'clock at night. I mean, there's, you know, work-life balance is, is also an important driver. And they're using technology to give themselves that balance. And this may be a case where you're not going to be able to train somebody to do that. You're, the, the companies are going to have to learn to adapt to that that's, that's exactly right. We need to adapt to the new workforce. It's not necessarily the workforce needs to because adapt. What we've been talking about here a little bit is the workforce adapting to industry, but we are saying that yeah, no, other, it's, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way deal. And, uh, I mean, for me, it's all about us adapting to this new generation. Uh, and, you know, us older guys, it's, it's tough to see, but these are the guys that are going to deliver the real acceleration through our businesses in the future. Yeah. Is this, Mark, is this something you're seeing as well? Uh, I mean, we've talked a lot about 
an adaptation, you know, the, the, the individuals needing to adapt, but is the system itself being changed by the new generation and the ways that they're interacting could be social media or, or other aspects? Yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this is a big issue for our business, for example. We're, you know, largest, largely still a bricks and mortar business. Uh, people come to our office and, and, and try to find jobs. Uh, the whole social media thing is changing that. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, you can work from anywhere these days. You don't have to have an office anymore, as, as uh, Tiger was talking about a little earlier. Um, you, you, can, you can work from home, you can work from the coffee shop, you can work 9 o'clock in the morning or midnight. And Are there any really concrete examples of how that, 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 that's showing up in your business and the way that you do things? Uh, we're... Uh, we're uh, expanding our uh, recruiting efforts through social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, there's still a lot yet to be seen as to how that's going to operate, but yes. Right. Tiger. So, so we have about a thousand out of the 60,000 people I talked about, we have over a thousand people who actually deliver services from home. The challenge is it's taken us five years as a program to get there. Uh, I wish that was 25,000. And the problem, to, to uh, Kevin's point, is, is corporations are not willing to change. It requires corporations to change because they need to, you know, obviously firewall their systems and technology and all of that to allow someone to access information from home in order to do what they have to do. But if, you, if we find a way to make that happen across larger chunks of work, uh, it saves, I mean, it saves all kinds of things. The environment, it saves, you know, work-life balance. I think it brings a whole new workforce into the workforce. I mean, think about the number of women who would then join the workforce if they had more flexibility in the amount of time, as well as the fact that they can do work, you know, from home in chunks of four hours and five hours. That would change the way work gets done. Right, and so from your perspective, you're trying to find all these ways we can move these chunks of work so that, frankly, you can grow your business and have more... And access uh, more, more talent. Clients. Yeah. Because it's there. Right. Right, right, and, and leverage th them. This is all a cultural shift, though. You know, yep. you, uh, yeah, and it's very difficult for organizations to do. Kevin. Yeah, I'll check, but I think we have over 20,000 home workers in the UK, BT. 20,000 uh, home workers. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's great because, you know, uh, A, technology allows it. B, we also offer it as a service to our customers. C, it saves a ton of money in property, uh, which, is, uh, which is always good. Property is never, never cheap. Um, and, and, you know, D gives you the, the work-life balance you need. I mean, so I think there's, a, there's going to be a change, actually, because this is uh, home workers, but my personal view is, like, the desktop is dead, right? And, and you know, whereas uh, for the last five to seven years, people have been working at home on a desktop, I think they now just work on the move. And, uh, you know, whether it be uh, down a coffee shop or whatever they're doing, I mean, uh, people just are working online all the time at a device at their hands, and that's, that's the game today. Um, so when we're talking home working, it's probably working away from the office rather than home working on the move wherever they're at, and uh, that's, that, that really is the new game. Okay. Very, Quite exciting. Very, very interesting. We have, we have a number of questions coming in, and also I'd like to highlight uh, Somia Kanti, who is going to be our rapporteur. He's the president of EduComp, which is India's largest... Uh, education company. The question coming in, which maybe is good for Ronald, is yes, uh, we, we've all agreed there are these change, generational changes happening. Uh, working from home uh, is possible when you have the, the, the technological link, but what if when there is a technology gap, when you don't have the access to this technology, is there a way to do that? Is this something that you're uh, confronting no. in, in your we're kind of, work? We're kind of on a hybrid mode because the countries we're in is, are not as advanced. So a lot of our kids, 47% of the population, I believe, lives on less than $2 a day. So it's hard to have one of these with that kind of a budget. They're not going to have an iPad. No. <laughs> exactly. So it changes things. On the other hand, we are working closely with Microsoft, we're working closely with Intel, because these kids need the skill in order to be competitive globally. We do a lot of English teaching because we want to get our, our graduates into the global economy. It's a key for their not only getting the job, but continuing their lifelong learning so that they can stay, stay employed. And so it's a different marketplace. You know, you go to Yemen, uh, I'll be in Yemen in two weeks, it's, it's a different world. It's like going back hundreds of years. Right. And so the rules of engagement, the requirements are much different, and we need to conform to the local needs of that labor market. 
And so I originally envisioned that we'd be a lot more, do a lot more online training. And we do a fair amount of that, but reality is in order to get the mindset created in our student, they need to have the experience of working with an instructor. This course that I mentioned earlier, that the, I think the face is, to face can't be replaced on some levels. Can be, but many instances can't. I had hoped that it could be replaced more often than not. And I find in order to have the product and have somebody graduate a course and have the skill set that's needed, they can't do it in front of a computer. They need to have an instructor. They need that interface. But, but we're, we're making, a, we're having an impact. We're having a tremendous change. This course, Teaching Work Skills, is a three-month course, and it's life-changing. But we can't even get beyond 25 students per class. If we push the envelope up to 30, the, the, the magic ingredient, the, the change there in a mindset and the empowerment and the belief that they can think out of the box and the belief that they can succeed doesn't happen as easily. Right, right. Uh, Tiger, India faces a lot of bandwidth constraints. Many of the markets in which you have a large portion of your workforce, uh, do you bring people together to aggregate around technology, or how do you, how do you overcome No, actually, these? you know, the, the, the reality is if you look at the top 20, 30, 40 cities, which is where, you know, a lot of our efforts are focused on, uh, there's not that much of a bandwidth constraint. Uh, people do have access to bandwidth, the kind of bandwidth that you need, not for video streaming, but for work to be done. That's not the issue. The issue is, you know, one, corporations allowing us to do that type of work for them. I.e. So breaking down a, a wall or a security issue that all they... All those. Yeah. And mindset issues more than anything else. Even if their technology head says, look, this is all completely secure, you may have a corporation say, I still don't want to do it because I don't think that's the way we do things. This, that's not the way we do things is a problem. The second is, when you have a distributed workforce, you still need to create a community. Um, and I think some corporations are, are wondering whether they should allow social media to come inside the company. So we implemented two years back our own internal social media platform that allows exactly the same touch, feel, and look as a Facebook, but it's inside. Mm -hmm. um, that allows people to form communities to solve problems. And over time, we've actually expanded that to people outside the, the four walls of the company. Because then you can access, access expertise outside because the true learning happens when you do it as a continuous learning and you're learning from the entire ecosystem, not just you know, people you know and people who are looking at you. Right, so people learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning effectively. You're, yeah. you're not having the top-down style. Right. Um, we've spoken a lot about this sort of end of things, the learning, the retooling and everything. I'd like to focus a little bit uh, now on retaining uh, and sort of a focus. I mean, Kevin, you and I had a very interesting discussion about how at certain levels in a company you have to accept, uh, even celebrate uh, churn, yep. uh, where at other levels you, you, you really, it's unacceptable and you need to focus on it. Maybe speak a little bit about your approach to uh, retention. Yeah, I mean, my, you know, my personal approach is uh, uh, I always look at my top 50 uh, in terms of talent. Out of 3,000? Yeah, top 50 uh, in, in, in the business and, and, you know, the top 50, are not necessarily a fixed 50. They might, uh, there might be promotions and relegations within it, but uh, uh, to me, that's the talent I absolutely have focused at, at, at keeping. I mean, that's my keep 50. Underneath that, you, uh, you have the, the middle tier, and uh, you know, I think uh, you know, a good 10%, 10% plus churn is, is uh, I think, uh, reasonably healthy. And I think that gives the ability for us to bring more younger talent into the into the business, more new talent into the business. Um, so, so to me, I think uh, uh, a flexible workforce, churn in the workforce is, is is a positive thing. I'm also a great passionate believer in uh, in performance management, uh, and I yeah. So think, how, how how do you what is the tactic yeah, for retaining I mean, the top fifty? So our tactic to retain the top fifty, I think you know you need to look at. Uh, uh, you know, career development, ambition, make sure they're satisfied, uh, make sure obviously the uh, financial side is also uh, their stock is there. So a whole combination of different things to keep that talent in place. Um, and, and, you know, from my perspective, from my personal perspective, that's actually worked. So a multitude of different things. Uh, but you also are bringing in new dimensions that people are... Uh, you know, the younger part of that 50 is typically not wanting to work all weekends, not wanting to work at one, two in the morning. 
Um, so, you know, the work-life balance factor is coming into this 50 as well now, which I think is a very positive thing. I also think a new dimension is, uh, is diversity in terms of talent. Uh, I think we need to, uh, uh, in Asia, I think we're, we're, we're starting a process of diversity. We're starting a process of gender balance. In certain countries like Japan, there's a long way to go. Uh, I think uh, we need to bring disability into play more in Asia. I think uh, that linkage isn't as strong as it should be. Um, so there's a whole aspect of diversity talent coming through as well we need to, we need to consider. Uh, Mark, if you could speak a little bit about the, the retention issue, you know, both the higher end, which Kevin is talking about, but also other aspects and, and the, the value of churn, maybe. And before you begin, uh, for our people joining us online, please send in your questions to hashtag WEFTalent uh, or an email to talent at WEF.ch, W-E-F, World Economic Forum, .ch, as in Switzerland. Mark. Yeah, sure. You know, retention is a very important aspect of our business because it costs typically more to go find new talent than it does to, uh, to teach and to, and to retain talent. And a part of the, uh, you know, fr from the lower end of the scale, you know, you always have to take care of the hygienic fa factors first. Can they eat? Can, can, do they have a roof over their head? And then uh, going beyond that to, you know, how, how comfortable can we make their life? Uh, but it, it's, it's more than that, I think. I mean. Uh, do they want to work with us? Uh, why do they want to work with us? What do we represent? Um, you know, our, our uh, motto is uh, better work, better life, just, just from our company perspective. So are we able to help these people have better work and therefore uh, translate that into, into a better life? Part of that is, are we giving them the tools? If, if we demand a certain level of output, are we giving them the tools so that they ha they're able to do the work productively without having to do it at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning? And, and I think this is really important. And this, this is not only the high-level people, but the low-level people, because they're also working on their cell phones and on their iPads. Can you speak a little bit about non-monetary compensation? What are the kinds of things that you found motivate people, get them to stick around, that aren't necessarily a, a, you know, money, cash? Uh, yeah, a, a pat on the back is really is a real good motivator. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'm I'm serious about that, and 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 uh, you know the pat on the back uh, can come from your 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 direct level boss, but it can also be a, uh, some form of recognition from two or three levels up. It could be the CEO, uh, and it can be you know just the walk around in the branch on the one hand, but it could also be. Um, when you, ha when you have uh, people who are doing a, a really good job, let the rest of the organization know about that. What did they do? How did they do it? Uh, and, and give them that recognition that they deserve. Tiger. So for us, this is extremely core to our business, managing uh, attrition, retention, particularly in the markets that we serve from, which are hyper-growth markets themselves. So. You know, one, you know, we drive uh, performance management pretty maniacally. Um, a little bit of our heritage is that, so, so we just... Performance management, that. you're measuring how... Are we you measure performance. These, these are your goals, and it's a very clear yeah, to and, the individual and, what they are supposed to and, accomplish. And we track that, and we track it not just for uh, lower-level people, but right up to the top. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we expect 10% of the workforce to churn at all levels of the organization. And we expect every leader to show that they have done it. Their performance is measured on whether they have been able to do it. You've retained too many people. You have not <laughs> taken 10% of the people who have not performed out. That's a goal. Uh, that allows fresh talent to come in. And the third is, while monetary compensation and, and options and all of that are great, our belief is that it only solves short-term problems. You obviously have to do that, but the real motivator is, can you provide more exposure? Can you provide more training? Can you take the people to levels of performance and expertise that they didn't imagine they could? And it actually starts with recruitment. Have you got people who are actually hungry to learn? Because if you have that, then you can match that with offering them the, the, the food for that hunger, and then it's a great match. If you don't have people who are hungry, then it's a problem. So you have an attitudinal problem. So you have to make sure your hiring is right. So we do a lot of... Six Sigma analysis on who's leaving, why they are leaving, and we came to the conclusion that actually retention starts with hiring. Right, so getting the right person in the workforce yeah. to begin with. 
Uh, Ronald, maybe you could speak a little bit about the, the, this issue of retention. We, we work backwards. We are on the other end of the product line. Right. We're training for jobs. And one of the sales points that we make is just the opposite. <laughs> because in the Middle East, there's a huge amount of job turnover. And so the fear of a typical employer that we deal with is that they're going to hire an individual that we train and in six months that person won't be there for various reasons. And so these are unacceptably high levels that, that exact a tremendous cost on the company. And so we run, our, we run our students through this workplace success, teaching them how to work better. We also work in close collaboration with employers. So oftentimes the employers will be with us in the room interviewing prospective candidates so that everybody knows what they're getting up front. And so it makes for a much more cohesive product and a much more um, fluid uh, process when we take somebody from the interview to the training to actually starting on the job. Additionally, to keep the retention, which is our challenge, it's not yours in terms of the other side of the scope, uh, we offer the training, we offer the placement, and equally important, the third leg of what we do is we offer our alumni continuous training. And so Manpower Group, for instance, gives us for free courses that they charge thousands of dollars for. And all of our alumni have the ability to take these courses at no cost so that they can stay ahead of the curve and they can continually be productive as their company evolves, as they evolve. And we have alumni centers where alumni come in, they get mentoring, they have computer access. Uh, for instance, in Yemen, a lot of the cost of the alumni center has been now defrayed because the alumni are so happy to have it that they're donating. In um, Egypt, for instance, the alumni were so engaged that up until recently, 60% of our alumni were donating back, a number that was 10 times what I expected on a good day. Why? Because we're giving them the tools to continue to retain their job and continue to grow. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, one thing that's come up here is the hiring process is, is important in the retention process. Maybe, Kevin, if you can speak a little bit about how that works from your perspective and maybe how it's evolved in the last five, ten years. Yeah, I, I think that's changing as well. I mean, obviously, we're, we're, we're connected to quite a large number of universities across the world and hiring talent um, through our graduate program. Uh, one of the interesting things that... Uh, we've recently done, as an example, in Hong Kong, is linked back to uh, the younger kids who perhaps have not come from the right social um, stability background where they don't really have an opportunity to go through to university, but they're equally as intelligent and bright and they just haven't had the chance. And uh, what we've done with a number of companies, actually, there's uh, um, with China Light and Power and the Jockey Club and HSBC and others is we take these kids in for six months um, and, uh, uh, and, we, and we rotate them and as soon as any of us like them we hire them. And these are kids that typically wouldn't get through the front door. So they wouldn't uh, because they haven't got the opportunity to go through the university to earn their one trillion of debt in the U.S. currently in the university uh, uh, debts, but uh, uh, but uh, it uh, I mean to me that's a great initiative. So from a social dimension, we're getting kids who are talented, perhaps not as polished, but for sure as good, and uh, and uh, and that's worked out very very well. I think we're in the third year of the program, and uh, I think this comes back to Tiger's point. Um, you know, you don't all have to have uh, gone to university. Uh, uh, you know, they're going to Genpax University in that case, right? That's great. So it is changing. Mark, for hiring, how, how have you, what shifts have you seen and, and how important is that, that process? I, I think part of the, uh, the, one of the real important aspects of the process is to make sure that the uh, people who come to interview understand what it is that they'll be expected to do. I mean, for example, we have a lot of people, uh, being in an HR business, there are a lot of people who have the idea uh, that they're just coming to, to help people get jobs. Right. And, and of course they are, but it's much more difficult than that. It's, uh, uh, there's, you have to face a lot of rejection. Um, customers don't always want the candidate that you propose to them. Who seems to be the perfect candidate. And exactly. <clears throat> uh, uh, so um, it, it's really important that, that uh, that they understand that yes, there is an HR aspect to the job, 
but there's also a sales aspect to the job. As a matter of fact, every job, every job has a sales aspect to it these days, uh, and, and as it should be. Um, but getting them to understand that uh, is, is a real differentiator, I think, in our business as to whether they'll last for six months or six years or, or much longer than that. Okay. I would like to uh, uh, open it up to questions in the room. If there are any, please raise your hand. We have microphones ready. Uh, we have quite a few questions here. Can you take this one in the front row first? Please identify yourself. Well, uh, I'm Aftab Ahmed from Pakistan. Uh, in most of the developing countries, it happens that the uh, young students and the researchers, they go to the uh, jobs in industry or in government sector, and uh, they are mostly interested in that. If we go for a small enterprise, then most of the, these young researchers, they can uh, get the job and they can employ others. So how we can actually change the mind of the people that they can go for a small enterprise in developing countries? Because there is no such trends. So I understand this. That's can, how can you encourage? How do you encourage talent to talent join to small, enterprise, small enterprises yeah. rather than the bigger enterprises? It's quite interesting, actually. I mean, I think, um, and I can't talk for Pakistan, uh, but um, certainly with my kids, uh, I would encourage them to to actually. Uh, uh, to actually go into their own businesses themselves uh, and, and, and develop their own SMEs. Um, I mean, I think there's just such a, um, a world of uh, talent plus uh, technology plus opportunity now uh, in the SME space. And, you know, from a personal perspective, I'll be encouraged from my kids down that route than perhaps working for a, a large multinational. And... So I, I think, uh, you know, if you look at any economy, SMEs is really the, 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 the in the Western economies, is really, really the, 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 the big part of the economy. If you look at uh, Hong Kong, 80% uh, of the economy is SMEs. Uh, I'm not sure what the percentage is in the US, but I'm sure it's a huge number. So, you know, that's the big segment, actually. Uh, and but I there's think, more opportunities, in effect, in that zone. And, and there's more opportunities, there's more initiative, there's more vision uh, to be applied. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, to me, I think that's going to be a desirable place to go in the future. I looked at it from your perspective as a large company. Yeah. Uh, how do you look at somebody who's had experience in a small company? Do you only consider somebody who's had experience in a previous big company? No, I think, uh, you know, people have had experience in, in a small company, and it depends what they've done, obviously, can bring really good, valuable insight uh, into a larger company. What I, do, what I do like with people who've been in a smaller company is they, they tend to have a real natural hunger. <laughs> to make things happen. They tend to be uh, multifunctional. Maybe don't see bureaucratic walls. That no bureaucrats. See. You know, but the, that the would bureau be... bureaucrat, the bureaucrats are not there. You know, they haven't had HR exception. departments and stuff to, 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 to do. So I think it's, you know... But Kevin, that would be an exception. Yeah. Uh, I think most large corporations, to be honest, would prefer and end up, therefore, biasing their hiring to people who spend time in large corporations. Now, if someone has spent time in large corporations and small enterprises, I think that's a perfect. Yeah, sure. Because then you have the best yeah. of both. But I think the question was more, you know, what if someone only wants to join a small enterprise? Um, and how do you encourage that to happen? I think one of the challenges is those small enterprises have to professionalize themselves a little bit more. Because if you go back to the question on retention, one of the reasons, uh, you know, one of our single biggest findings for people leaving is their supervisor they don't like. In small enterprises, Often the supervisor is the owner. So how do you teach the owner to manage five people in a very professional way? Because then the chances are those people join and they last and they don't leave and so on. So you almost have to have programs that professionalize ownership and the way they run small enterprises. And you're sort of making a pitch reverse to our questioner in a way that there's real advantages to joining a large organization because you'll have that opportunity so, to grow where if you're running your own shop and it's a five-person shop, you're, yes, you have those advantages of being a self-starter. You're not going to see bureaucracy, but you might not have those learning advantages that everybody here on this, this, this platform has emphasized. Would, I, I would think so. I think a mix is what ultimately works really well. Yeah. One of the, so everybody wants to talk. Yes. <laughs> one of the challenges that we have in the Middle East is there is a mindset amongst the youth, which hopefully is changing, 
where the ideal job is working not for small enterprise, but for working for government. And these governments are saturated. They don't need any more employees. It's the, you know, it, it's um, in Egypt, the joke is that the government uh, pretends to hire you and pretends to pay you. You know, it, it keeps social. It's almost like a welfare system. So we, we are pushing away from that. And one of our most successful courses is teaching entrepreneurship. We also believe, by the way, that empowering women in the region is key to the success of the region. We have a course that we launched recently in Jordan in entrepreneurship. And one of the shocking statistics that pleased the heck out of me was that 80% of the enrollees in this course teaching entrepreneurship are women. Apparently, the culture is such that they have less of a fear of failure. I think so they're willing to go out and join that small organization or launch that? Much more so. And it's a great opportunity for us to bring women into the workforce, which, which we think is key to the success of these countries. OK, Mark? Yeah, that's exactly right. Entrepreneurship is, a, is one of the points I wanted to raise. But I'll just go on to the other one, which is that universities uh, need to promote the idea among students uh, that they should focus first on what they want to do and second on who they want to do it for. Um, so if because you want to, often they're doing the, the reverse. Exactly. They say they want to work for a Sony or a Toshiba or whatever, uh, as opposed to saying, I want to be an accountant or I want to be a salesperson. Right. And, and they should develop their skill first in the, in find the, the occupation and that then... they Exactly. Find their passion first and then figure out, is it a small company, is it a big company? Okay. Excellent. That's a very good question. There's another question. Oh, there's a whole bunch of questions. Uh, sorry, first the gentleman and then the lady next. I have two Wait for the microphone. We have the online viewers who please send in your tweets uh, and your uh, I am Arun Agrawal from questions. India, Patna. Uh, I have two observations. One is training for innovations, doing innovative works. And another is training for the regular works. Second observation is migration is natural from developing countries to developed countries or from a developing companies to a developed companies or from SME to big companies. This is my observation. Oh, observation rather than a question. Okay, well, the la lady next to you perhaps has a question. My name is Christine from China, and uh, I have a question for the panels. What's your um, comment on today's MBA education? Do you see the MBAs have the... Um, how will you rate the MBA's job performance versus the ones that are gain experience on the work in general? This okay. is my first question. And my second question is, how will you define a talent? What is the top one characteristic of, the, of a talent? Of, sorry? Of a talent. Okay. Of a talent. Okay. Uh, well, let's, let's focus. I, I like the, the MBA question in the sense that you are looking at sort of more advice, career advice. Let's, we haven't sort of taken an angle on that. Switch around the optic. You're talking to a young person who's maybe thinking of a big enterprise or a small enterprise. They're thinking about doing an MBA. Uh, what are the pieces of advice you give them? Should they be aiming for an MBA? Uh, and maybe that's not an option for them. What are, I mean, Kevin spoke earlier a little bit about specialization. What's the career advice you would give to somebody entering this workforce right now how they should move forward. And I'd love to get that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, my perspective uh, is if you look at uh, the percentage of unemployment in, um, <clears throat> in students around the world, um, as I said, not in every geography. We're probably more blessed in Asia than anywhere else. But my clear advice would be um, following universities to get, get, get a job as quickly as possible. Uh, that's number one. Uh, so, as it, opposed to university MBA. Yeah. So get, don't get, don't go don't don't go get, straight in for that MBA. Get, get through the door, um, because you know one of the other concerns I've got is the amount of debt the kids are coming out with, uh, and debt that potentially they won't be able to pay off. Uh, you know, it's quite quite interesting. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know in the U.S. the government's actually underwritten all the, the student debt there. It's another another. Price uh, tab there, but coming back to the question, the um, the first thing is to get get a role, get a role preferably you know in something that that you really like. I think that's really important. And then secondly, um, you know, start to develop your career. And I personally wouldn't uh, say look at an MBA till you know four or five years at least of uh, of experience in in the workplace and then you do see the value and then then there's value also there's value from a, a broader perspective of course yeah for, for sure but but i i mean the clear thing is to me is to you know 
don't be one of the 20, 30, 40, in, in Spain, 50% of the graduates that are unemployed. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's a function of the marketplace in which you're employed. And in countries that I operate, and we're in Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, Yemen, Gaza, West Bank, Tunisia, um, there's an inverse correlation between more education and employability. As I mentioned earlier, in, in Jordan, unemployment right now is 14%. Unemployment for college grads is 24%. So probably Meaning if you have an should MBA, not get educated? You should get educated, but you should get educated in fields where there's a demand. Right. We're now working in Morocco, we're working with one of the largest universities, and we are helping them increase the percentage of the graduates that actually get into the labor market. The, their graduates, and this is a large university, public university, 7,000 grads a year, the percentage of their graduates that get employed is very, very low. And so we're now working with them, and it's our hope, expectation, that by revamping their curriculum and methodologies, we can get them up to the level of 75, 80%, which is about three times where it is now. So in the region that we operate, to answer your question, an MBA does not solve the problem. Uh, it can make a bigger problem because there isn't a market internally yet. The economy, the, the systems haven't caught up with the need for an MBA. Clearly there'll be need. It's, it's a good thing. I have two MBAs, but I, I operate in the U.S. and it was a different basis of operation. You have two MBAs? Yeah. One wasn't enough. Uh, <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> I was insecure. No, but in the U.S. it was helpful. Right. In the countries that I'm operating in, by and large, it would not have been helpful. Right, right, right. But I, mean, but, but, I think, but I think the lesson you're talking about isn't just applicable to the area of the world you're talking about. I think it's also valuable. And, you know, when you're making those educational choices, decide, are, you know, is this something where there is a market? Is this something that, the, that is giving me skills that are going to give me a job when I come out? Or relevant. am I going to be the 24% of those highly educated who don't have jobs? Exactly. Tiger, your advice. So, to, so, uh, so one is uh, we do find, depending on the market, uh, MBAs who don't have any work experience to actually not get any practical knowledge through their MBA, and that's a problem. So they come out even more theoretical than, um, than otherwise they are. And two, they also have a chip on their shoulder. So theory plus chip on your shoulder is a bad combination in a corporation. <laughs> uh, so, so, so the recommendation would be, uh, you know, you contrast that with, for example, the US, where we also hire a lot of people, but the MBAs there have worked before, have spent time in organizations, and then when they do their MBA, even though the curriculum may not have enough of practical stuff, they, I mean, they can relate it back to practice. So I think we have much better success in terms of hitting the ball out of the park when you, when you, you know, go after MBAs in, uh, in more developed economies. I think the developing economies have to fix their MBA programs. So you um, think even the MBAs themselves are, are having less relevance? They do, and they take time to adjust to the corporate life. Plus, they have a chip on the shoulder, so you first have to knock the chip off. Right. In any case, most of them end up joining investment banks. Um, so Clearly you know, not joining your organization. Power, power to them. <laughs> uh, but, the re but, but, but if we can fix the, the practicality of the content, it is a great, a great uh, career path because right. it does broaden your uh, perspective. Rather than having a narrow focus. Rather than keeping it narrow. It allows you to connect the dots and then you can apply it in practice. I think it's a great combination. You must combine it with what the market wants. Yeah, yeah. We've built a mini MBA program. We call it a mini, it's our own language. And but what basically it does, it takes university graduates that have the theory and don't have the work experience and the practical knowledge, and it teaches them to solve problems. It takes them through eight quarters of a business cycle and throws all sorts of challenges at them, and they have to come up with solutions. Right. So in other words, it's, it's a, a modification, as we've been talking about, of the educational system, making it more adapted to the market. Exactly. So Mark, final thoughts here. Uh, yeah, this comes from somebody who doesn't have an MBA, by the way. You don't have two. You don't even <laughs> I don't have, have one. I don't even have one. I'll give you one. They're not worth shit. When I came out of university, that was my goal. I wanted to go get an MBA, and I thought that was the greatest thing since uh, sliced bread. But uh, after working for a few years and finding my passion, and uh, re-examining that, I, I figured I didn't need it anymore. And uh, so that's what I would suggest is, first of all, as Kevin said, go find a job first, go find a role, uh, do some learning, keep the goal in mind. If you still want to do it after three years or four years, then ask yourself, why is it that I want the MBA and what is it going to do for me when I'm done? 
And if you still want to do it after that, go for it. Excellent. Okay, we've heard a lot of ideas from our, our panelists today. We're re relying on uh, Somia Kanti from EduComp to uh, uh, give us a good resume, but we've been talking about social media, specialization, uh, the hiring process, retooling, uh, education was certainly a focus that everybody had here. Uh, the changes in the way that, that the workforce itself is adapting to uh, work, uh, hiring, uh, and finally MBAs. Um, I would like to thank our online audience for their, their, their great questions, our audience here for the questions, and of course our panelists for their insights into managing human capital. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you.